everyone, this is going to be uh, 7.3, uh, the rest of it, and 7.4 and 0.5. Uh, we're going to get through most of the Civil War here and finish up with the next section. So let's look at the resources and the strategies of all sides during the Civil War. So first of all, let's know our combatants. Uh, in the north, we have the Union States in blue. In the south, we have the Confederate States in gray. In the middle, we have border states that are red. Border states are states that stayed with the Union, but still owned enslaved people, and they were very much on the border. They were um, tenuously linked to the north. So, what did the North have? The North had about 21 million people compared to the 9 million in the South. And also, don't forget that uh, about one-third of those were uh, enslaved, and so they were not going to be fighting in this war. The North had better industry, better factories, better railroads, bigger cities, uh, and a, uh, a manpower that kept uh, coming in from out of the country, which meant that we had uh, a restock of people that we could use. Now, with more ships, we were also able to blockade the South, meaning that we could uh, stop their ships from coming and going and stop any money from getting in. Uh, also, we had Abraham Lincoln, who, while not well-versed in war, uh, taught himself how to uh, be a wartime president and ended up being one of our greatest presidents ever, if not the greatest. So this is the northern blockade of the uh, both the Mississippi River and the uh, east coast of America. The Confederacy had a cause, which is uh, they were fighting for their right to exist. They were fighting for the right to own enslaved people. They were fighting because the North went down to the South. Um, Northerners didn't necessarily have the same sort of uh, cause to fight for, at least at first. They also had a very strong military tradition uh, of people. Uh, a lot of Southerners went to West Point and fought in the military. Um, their generals were very good, including uh, Robert E. Lee of Virginia, who was a very good general. So Robert E. Lee, 1807-1870, uh, from Virginia. Uh, he was a colonel in the U.S. Army before leaving and becoming a general in the Confederate Army. Uh, and he was offered command, actually, of the United States forces by Lincoln uh, the night before he left to go join the Confederates instead. Uh, and also, he married into the Washington family. He married a Custis, and the Custises were uh, uh, George Washington's wife's family. Uh, and they also made his home into Arlington National Cemetery on purpose. They made it a cemetery so he couldn't move back there at the end of the war. The South had a few advantages. They couldn't. Uh, they didn't have to invade the Union. They didn't have to play offense. They really only had to play defense. Uh, they also uh, knew the land they were fighting on, which gave them the advantage of tactics. Now, the South hoped that if they could prolong the war long enough, eventually the Union would get weary of fighting and just give up. Uh, they also hoped possibly that uh, they would receive international recognition from England or France, who uh, depended on the South for cotton, so they hoped that one of them would recognize them as a legit country. Now, in the North, Winfield Scott hoped to attack the Confederacy in several ways. Uh, first of all, uh, blockade the southern ports with American ships. Second of all, move down the Mississippi River and basically encircle the South. Uh, this is known as the Anaconda Plan, uh, where you would encircle them like a giant snake and, and uh, uh, basically um, suck the, the air out of them. Uh, there was no talk of ending slavery, at least at first, in this plan. So this is what the Anaconda Plan would have looked like. Uh, surround them and starve them out, basically. Now, the border states, the states that stayed loyal to the Union but still were slave states, uh, were very important to Lincoln because if they left, uh, they could tip the advantage towards the South. Uh, Lincoln, however, insisted that the war was only about reunification, not about ending slavery, and he did this so he would uh, sort of keep the border states appeased. So here are the border states, Missouri, Kentucky, uh, West Virginia, which became a state only when Virginia left, Maryland, and Delaware. So let's look quickly at the first year of the Civil War. So it took a few months, first of all, for both sides to get ready to fight, actually. Um, and then in July 1861, uh, the Union, led by Irvin McDowell, moved south to take the Confederate capital in Richmond, Virginia. Uh, and this was the first major battle of the Civil War. Both sides met at a railroad junction called Manassas. Uh, the North called this the Battle of Bull Run. 
So here is Manassas, Virginia, on its way to Richmond. Now, at first it looked like this was going to be a quick win for the uh, for the uh, Northern Army and possibly even the start and the end of the war. However, a, a group of Confederates held out until reinforcements arrived, uh, and this led to uh, eventually the Southerners, led by Stonewall Jackson, defeating the Northerners at the Battle of Bull Run. Uh, the Union lost, and so uh, Lincoln replaced Irvin McDowell with George McClellan. This is something we'll see over and over again, is that basically Lincoln could not find the right general uh, to lead the Northern Army, so he basically had a revolving door of generals. So here's George McClellan, 1826 to 1885, from Pennsylvania, uh, but he lived mostly in New York and Jersey. He was a uh, soldier. He was also a politician. He ran for president uh, against Lincoln in 1864 and later became governor of New Jersey. Uh, he also had very little respect for Lincoln. He called him an idiot and a baboon at times. Uh, and because of this, he was hired twice by Lincoln and fired twice by Lincoln. So that's going on in the East. In the West, uh, in Tennessee, uh, Ulysses S. Grant, the Union general, is trying to capture the Mississippi River. Um, he fights his way down the Mississippi. Uh, he fights at Fort Henry, Fort Donaldson. Uh, he fought a very tough two-day battle in Tennessee at the Battle of Shiloh. Uh, both sides were really horrified at the losses, thousands of soldiers dying. Um, now, Shiloh did show, however, that... Grant was a different kind of general than all the other generals. Usually, uh, if a general fought a battle and lost, or even sometimes if they fought a battle and won uh, in the north, they would immediately retreat and head back um, to the safety of Washington, D.C. Grant, however, lost the first day and he said, you know what, forget it. Uh, I'm going to keep pushing forward. And he was able to uh, push the Southerners off the field in Shiloh. So here's Ulysses S. Grant, 1822 to 1885, from Ohio, uh, but moved throughout the country, including in St. Louis, as those of us who have visited Grant's farm know. He was a soldier. Later on, he was president of the United States uh, for eight years. Uh, and what killed him eventually was that he smoked up to 20 cigars a day, and this gave him throat cancer at the end of his life. Now, there were very few naval battles during this war. However, the North and the South both created new boats that were wooden boats covered in steel and iron uh, called ironclads. And uh, these uh, meant that regular cannon shot would just bounce off of them. Uh, and both of these uh, fought each other at the Battle of Hampton Roads, a one-time fight. Uh, after the fight, both kind of limped off and were never used again. Uh, but the Merrimack and the Monitor, these two ships fought to a draw, but this showed that there was a new technology on the, on the uh, forefront here. So here's the Battle of Hampton Roads with the Merrimack and the Monitor. Now let's look, uh, continue our stalemate in the east. Uh, while the Union Army had been doing pretty well in the west, uh, there had been a stall in the east, and that was partially due at least to McClellan. McClellan had uh, done very well at creating a very well organized, very well prepared, very well drilled uh, army for the North. However, he was also very cautious and paranoid and moved very slowly. Um, he constantly believed he was outnumbered uh, and was demanding more troops and insulting Lincoln. And when Lincoln ordered him to move, he did it very slowly. Eventually, Lincoln did demand that he moved, uh, and McClellan slowly moved down the Virginia Peninsula uh, to take Richmond uh, in, the in the Peninsula Campaign of 1862, uh, March through May of 1862, as we see here. Now, McClellan uh, had the larger army, but he moved slowly, and like I said, he was paranoid that he was always outnumbered. Uh, and he was up against the Confederate General Robert E. Lee, uh, in a series of battles known as the Battles of the Seven Days. Um, eventually, even though M McClellan won most of these battles, he considered them losses and he fled back to D.C., uh, where Lincoln fired him and replaced him with a guy named John Pope. By the way, you don't need to know all these names, but this is the number of revolving doors that we see here. Pope led the army down towards uh, Richmond, but lost for a second time at the Battle of Manassas, again, uh, the second battle. Uh, after this, Lincoln replaced Pope with George McClellan. He couldn't find a good general, so you got to use who you got, I guess. 
Now, let's look at African Americans and the war. Uh, Frederick Douglass once said, Civil war was not a mere strife for territory and dominion, but a contest of civilization against barbarism. Uh, Frederick Douglass basically saying that there was a higher uh, purpose to the war than just reunification. Let's look at emancipation, freeing enslaved people. Uh, Lincoln had several reasons to call for emancipation other than the fact that it was the morally right thing to do, uh, obviously. Uh, he had been being pestered by uh, abolitionists like Frederick Douglass for months now, calling for the freeing of slaves. Uh, also, uh, England and France were less likely to uh, recognize the South if they were still a slave-owning country. Basically, it was politically... Uh, expedient to get rid of enslavement as well. Here's a uh, an abolitionist illustration. Am I not a man and a brother was the sort of constant refrain. Now, we did have some generals who actually tried to uh, free enslaved people early. Um, guys like Benjamin Butler in uh, New Orleans uh, actually kept slaves as what he called contraband. We couldn't release them as people, so instead we called them captured supplies and put them to work in union, union camps so that we didn't have to send them back to their owners in the South. John C. Fremont in St. Louis actually started freeing slaves in 1861. Uh, however, Lincoln forced him to stop uh, because he was like, look, I'm the one in charge of when we free enslaved people, not you. Um, and it was m more than a year until Lincoln did it. Now, in secret, though, Lincoln started to plan to uh, free at least some enslaved people during this time. Uh, and he told his cabinet about it. He said, I think this will help out the war effort. And the cabinet said, you should do it, but you should wait until we have a Union victory. Otherwise, it would look like, you know, this is just like the last uh, desperate move of a failing country. Unfortunately, victories were not in uh, high supply at that time. In fact, we kept losing. So uh, we had to wait for the right victory. Uh, and it came after Robert E. Lee, who had been winning a series of battles, decided that he was going to invade the North. Uh, he invaded Maryland, hoping that he could get the border states uh, to join him in the rebellion. However, some northern soldiers were able to find Lee's battle plans. They were actually wrapped uh, around several cigars at the time. Uh, and McClellan used these plans to surprise Lee and eventually defeat him at the Battle of Antietam. And this is one of many photos taken by photographer Matthew Harrison Brady uh, for his uh, show called The Dead of Antietam. Antietam was the bloodiest day of the war. Over 5,000 people were killed. Uh, tens of thousands were wounded and casualties were high. Uh, however, in the end, uh, McClellan defeated Lee and Lee retreated back to Virginia. Um, and this was what Lincoln was waiting for to release the Emancipation Proclamation. Uh, and he released it, uh, he announced it at least, on September 22nd, 1862. He said uh, he's going to release it on January 1st of 1863. Um, that way he was giving them a little bit of time to surrender the South if they didn't want to uh, lose their enslaved people. The proclamation said that slaves were free in all areas that were still in rebellion against America. Uh, however, it did not free any enslaved people in the border states uh, or in the areas we already controlled, like Kentucky, um, not Kentucky, like Tennessee, or like um, New Orleans, Louisiana. Lincoln hoped that it might persuade the South to surrender. However, they did not. Uh, now, some of the North were happy with this, especially abolitionists. However, some were not as pleased um, ab some abolitionists actually thought that it wasn't enough, that it was a halfway measure. It was not freeing all slaves. Uh, the South, of course, thought it was a horrible thing. Technically, the Emancipation Proclamation didn't do very, li do very much, especially right off the bat. Um, however, for the first time, the war had become publicly about slavery, and Lincoln was saying, we are going to end slavery, and they are always going to be free after this, forever free, as the Emancipation Proclamation says. The proclamation also convinced many African Americans to join the army. Um, the uh, Emancipation Proclamation allowed for uh, volunteer African American troops to join the army. So we see uh, a young example of a drummer boy here who joined the army. 
Now, let's look at how African Americans joined the fight during this time. They'd already been in the fight. Uh, enslaved people were one of the best resources that uh, the North had for information regarding the South. However, after the proclamation, the president got a lot of African American volunteers, over 180,000 by the end of the war, and about a third of them died during the war. Uh, one of the most famous volunteer units was the 54th Massachusetts uh, Regiment, which was formed from free men and from run runaway slaves. Uh, the 54th Massachusetts suffered about 50% casualties by the end of the war. So here's a plaque outside the uh, State House in Boston uh, honoring the 54th. The soldiers are African American, the officers, as you can see, are white. Now, African Americans did have to face a lot of prejudice while in uniform. Uh, however, they uh, eventually earned the respect of their uh, white fellow soldiers uh, due to the fact that they were fearless in battle. Uh, white soldiers were like, they're going to run away at the first sign of battle. That proved to be absolutely not true. Uh, even in cases where they suffered heavy losses, like when the 54th Massachusetts uh, lost 50% of their men in the disastrous attack on Fort Wagner in South Carolina, they continued to fight. They would not give up fighting. Uh, in the end, it took three years for African-American soldiers to get equal pay. Also, one of the major issues for African-American soldiers is if they were captured, uh, oftentimes, even if they surrendered, uh, they were just executed on the spot. Uh, this happened at what's called Fort Pillow, where African-Americans surrendered and uh, the, the uh, Confederate soldiers literally just executed them. Now, let's look at everyday life during the war. Uh, William Tecumseh Sherman, uh, general for the North, once said, War is cruelty. There's no use trying to reform it. The crueler it is, the sooner it will be over. Uh, this became known as total war later on. Now, let's look at daily life in the North. The war had a big impact on our industry. It was good for industry. And we see the demand for clothes and weapons and other supplies was very high. So, excuse me, the war helped to uh, mechanize the factories a little bit. However, it was also a very expensive war, and to cover it, we uh, passed our first income tax, uh, which is a tax, tax based on uh, the earnings of individuals. And it started as a 3% income tax on any income over $800 a year, and it would continue to go up as the war went on. Pardon me, I have the hiccups for some reason. <clears throat> the government also sold government bonds, which are basically IOUs, which said that if you donate money to the U.S. government right now, the U.S. government will pay you back later with interest, with uh, give you more money. Excuse me. Uh, however, it was not just about making money. It was also a patriotic thing to buy war bonds. Uh, we still see this in uh, wartime, especially World War One. In World War II, we see that uh, war bonds were sold by the U.S. Army, and uh, again, it was seen as like a patriotic thing to do. This is what a civil war bond looks like. Now, thanks to the Civil War, the government could start to sell land in the West without worrying about the issue of slavery. In 1862, uh, Congress passed what's called the Homestead Act, which gave away a lot of West Western land basically for free. Uh, as long as the families promise to improve the land and uh, stay on that land at, le at least for five years. Pardon me, gosh. Congress also passed a bill to create a transcontinental railroad during this time, although it was not finished until, until 1869, five years after the end of, uh, four years after the end of the war. Now, both the North and the South eventually uh, instituted a draft, which meant that you were forced to join the army. This is also known as conscription. In the North, you could get out of it, out of it if you were able to pay $300. Uh, this made uh, the uh, poorer people of the North very upset and very angry. In New York City, uh, anger at this new draft started the New York draft riots in July of 1863. Um, the... Uh, African Americans of New York City were blamed for the war and targeted, uh, and so over a hundred people died during the New York draft riots, including a lot of African Americans. Uh, here we see the uh, the burning during the New York draft riots. In the South, one of the main differences between the North and the South is that the North could afford to continue a lot of uh, things during the war. 
the Civil War had a huge economic burden on the South, excuse me, on the South, and they didn't have the resources to keep it up. The war reduced the worth of a lot of Southern assets, and so the South found it very hard to pay for this war. God, I hate these hiccups. The South printed paper money, too. However, it was not backed by gold like Northern, northern uh, money was. And so as the price of goods grew, Confederate money grew worthless. This is called inflation, where basically the price of uh, things continues to rise to the point where Paper money is basically not worth the paper it's printed on anymore, and this actually caused a lot of riots in southern cities as well. So here is a Confederate $5 bill that is more or less worthless by the end of the war. Now, looking at a soldier's life. For a lot of soldiers, this was the first time that they had ever left their hometown, and so they got very homesick. Some dealt with it in bad ways, like drinking. Some... Uh, however, dealt with it in uh, ways like writing letters home and joining religious revivals. Many families, especially in families from the border states, uh, had to deal with the fact that they were losing men to both the North and the South. Um, this was a war that literally pitted brother against brother uh, and friends against friends. A good example is Abraham Lincoln. He married into the Southern-leaning Todd family who were slave owners from Kentucky. And so Abraham Lincoln's own in-laws joined the Confederacy, which raised, raised a lot of eyebrows towards Mary Todd. Uh, so for another example here, George and Thomas Crittenden from Kentucky, uh, they were both brothers. They were both brigadier generals, but one was a Union general, one was a Southern one. We also see new technology during this war that caused the death rate to spike. Uh, Rifles got a lot more accurate, and Gatling guns and repeating rifles could really kill a lot of people. Uh, just as deadly as um, the battles themselves was illness as well. Uh, illnesses raged in camps, and for every soldier killed by the enemy, two died from disease. Uh, especially in prison camps, which were uh, infamous for not having uh, great sanitation, uh, being malnutrition, uh, very little food to eat. Uh, Andersonville in Georgia was the most famous of these uh, Civil War prison camps. Over 12,000 Union soldiers died there in just 15 months. So this is a Civil War surgeon performing an amputation right here. And this was a Union prisoner from Andersonville starved nearly to death. He is alive in this picture. Lastly, let's look at the role of women in this war. Most women did not fight, although a few did. They dressed as men and fought, although many did join the workforce. They ran family businesses, they went to work in factories, they uh, worked on their family farms and plantations. Um, a few jobs that uh, were done by, uh, almost entirely by men, were now done by women, including the role of being a teacher. Uh, some women did, like I say, dress as men and go into battle. However, others worked in the camps or worked as nurses or as cooks. Uh, some also, North and South, became spies. Women were great spies because um, men generally did not see them as the spying sort. So here's a female Civil War soldier who uh, dressed as a man in order to fight. Probably the most prominent job for women during this time was nurses. They were, there were many uh, nurses during the Civil War. Uh, women like Clara Barton, who helped nurse the sick and the wounded. Uh, President Lincoln actually... Uh, during this time, approved the U.S. Sanitary Commission as well, which uh, helped to keep the camps clean, uh, but they were mainly run by women. So here is Clara Barton, uh, alive from 1821 to 1912 from Massachusetts. <laughs> Excuse me. She was a hospital nurse and a teacher and a suffragist. Uh, she helped to found the American branch of the American Red Cross in 1881, and as a nurse, she was close enough to the fighting that bullets tore her clothes, but she was never actually injured uh, during the war. Hopefully I'll stop hiccuping in the next uh, lecture.